So welcome, and thank you for joining us today, even though this is midterm week and we are perched on the edge of a vacation. My name is Jennifer Widener. I teach at the Woodrow Wilson School, and I direct something called Innovations for Successful Societies, which is a research program held jointly by the Woodrow Wilson School and the Bobst Center for Peace and Justice. It profiles public sector innovation around the globe. It's my great pleasure today to introduce Governor Mitch Daniels, who will speak about the reforms he has spearheaded in Indiana. Mitchell E. Daniels, Jr. was elected as the 49th governor of the state of Indiana in 2004 and re-elected in 2008 to a second and final term, receiving more votes than any candidate for any public office in the state's history. Governor Daniels came from a successful career in business and government. He worked his work as CEO of the Hudson Institute and as president of Eli Lilly's North American Pharmaceutical Operations taught him the business skills he brought to state government. He also served as Chief of Staff to Senator Richard Lugar, Senior Advisor to President Ronald Reagan, and Director of the Office of Management and Budget under President George W. Bush. On his first day in office, Governor Daniels created the state's first Office of Management and Budget to look for efficiencies and cost savings across state government. He adapted the governor's office so that he, it could work effectively with department heads to develop priorities and to meet these important goals. He introduced performance measurement and improved service delivery in a wide range of departments, including the Bureau of Motor Vehicles and the Department of Child Services. In 2005, he led the state to its first balanced budget in eight years and, without a tax increase, transformed the nearly $800 million deficit he inherited into a surplus. The governor also repaid hundreds of millions of dollars the state had borrowed from Indiana's public schools, state universities, and local units of government in previous administrations, and reduced the state's overall debt by 40%. In 2008, Site Selection Magazine and CNBC both named Indiana as the most improved state for business in the country. Today, Indiana has a AAA credit rating, the first in the state's history, and the fewest state employees per capita in the United States. As some of you know, Governor Daniels earned a bachelor's degree from the Woodrow Wilson School here at Princeton in 1971. He later earned a law degree from Georgetown University. But Governor Daniels has another Princeton connection. Our Innovation for Successful Societies program is currently helping chiefs of staff in presidents and prime ministers' offices around the globe to find ways to improve the performance of their offices and to improve the focus on priorities. They asked us for American examples. We turned to Governor Daniels, uh, and he kindly assented to our request to profile his work. Governor O'Malley in Maryland has also participated in this as well and will be doing a separate case study. Some of you were here early enough to receive a copy of the case study, which will be published in about 10 days. Uh, we will encourage you to use the material on the website if you haven't received a copy. We also have a one-page version down here. Uh, the government, governor plans to discuss these reforms today and will respond to questions at the end. We have to end promptly at one because I believe a class is coming into the room. So Governor Daniels, thank you very much for coming. Well, thanks to Jennifer and thanks to, uh, to each of you for being here. I've looked forward to this opportunity for um, all the obvious reasons. I don't get back that often and each time's a treat. I'm going to be very respectful to Jennifer uh, because she gets the last word, and I've, I had a recent lesson in um, the importance of, uh, of that. I had uh, some surgery done on a um, running injury on my knee, and uh, the surgeon become a friend of mine, and be, thinking to be a funny guy, I, that morning I took a mar black marker, and on the, uh, on the injured leg I wrote in giant letters, this one, dumb dumb. <laughs> I woke from the anesthetic with pink toenails. <laughs> so I've been a lot more courteous to my hosts ever since. Um, I want to first commend the Wilson School on what, at, at least uh, from the glimpse I've had, looks like a terrific initiative, one that I've been hoping uh, that school, some school like this would undertake, if I understand it at all. 
um, and that is uh, that it uh, will look, at least in large part, at the effectiveness of government. There is no shortage of people who are prepared, who are writing uh, uh, tomes and prepared to advise people about uh, policy. And we all have our views, and those are important debates. But what is in my experience, sadly underattended is the need to implement that policy effectively, whatever choices a given uh, polity has made. And, uh, and moreover, government's uh, consistent failure to deliver at any level of productivity or effectiveness leads uh, all too often to a disregard, even a disdain for government. And that's not good regardless of your outlook, or so I believe. I've always thought that uh, if there was a single thing that people of vastly different philosophic uh, points of view ought to agree on, it should be that whatever government does choose to do, um, it ought to be done uh, as well as possible and that people ought to be accountable for that. But it just, uh, uh, both sides, uh, all sides, seem uh, uh, very uninterested in that subject. Uh, my friend P.J. O'Rourke once said, a Republican is someone who thinks government can't do anything right and then gets elected and proves it. <laughs> and on the other side of, of, of most of our divides are people who just have a reflexive defensiveness and, you know, just re and, and uh, don't even want to look to see, don't even want to ask the question whether these things with uh, uh, all well-intended and so forth are actually serving people well actually delivering any kind of results that, like those that were intended. You know, in the simplest form, we have strident debates about what is to be done and huge arguments about how much is to be done, usually meaning spent, and almost none about how well anything is being done. And so to the extent that the Wilson School is beginning to work more deeply in this area and try to transmit um, uh, those few good lessons that may be out there around the nation and the world, hats off. Um, let me try to summarize the uh, observations and convictions I've come to over a, a variety of experiences in just a few uh, basic thoughts. And, and, and let me just tell you a little bit about the, hand, the experience we've uh, had the last eight years in our state. The central reality, it seems to me, is that uh, in order for government to have a chance of doing what it hopes to do and intends to do, uh, one has to implant accountability. It is not there otherwise, for the simplest of reasons. Government is the last monopoly. And in the absence of any competition, um, there's very little impulse to uh, do things better. There's no reward for doing it. There's no penalty for not doing it. Uh, in most of life, uh, the world measures you. Uh, if you're in business, um, your sales go up or down, your, your, um, your profits likewise. If you're a public company, your stock price is a measurement. Uh, your share of market, uh, people are uh, watching all the time. Uh, but uh, that, uh, that external driver is just not there in most cases in, in government. I gave a speech one time to the assembled uh, uh, top leadership of the, of the federal government, the top appointed officers and SES appointees, and I, 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 I titled my little talk, Unnatural Acts. <laughs> I thought that might draw a little a crowd, and it did. <laughs> but what, I, what I, I, I quickly disappointed him by saying, the, what I want to talk about is, are the acts of, of um, delivering uh, effectively and accountably a better results at what you're doing does not come naturally in government. I mean, a, a few examples from our um, entry into Indiana government in, in 2005. Um, the Department of Natural Resources was charging exactly the same amount for a, a cabin or, a, or a, 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 a camping site on Christmas Eve as on the 4th of July. Now, anybody running a hotel or anything like it would price seasonally, but it didn't occur to them to do it. Um, I was uh, always fascinated as just a citizen and a candidate to encounter the last toll booth on our state-run toll road before Chicago was 15 cents, which is not easy to come by these days. You know, who's got a nickel, right? <laughs> and uh, so I got to government and I asked somebody, I said, you know that 15 cent toll booth? I said, that's interesting. I mean, uh, uh, they said, I said uh, 
why is it 15 cents? They said, well, it's been that way since 1985. And they, you know, they don't want to irritate anybody by raising the tolls. I said, okay, um, what's it cost us to collect the toll? Well, it's government, nobody knew. So I said, go figure it out. They came back in a couple weeks, they said, we think it's about 34 cents. <laughs> I said, that's a great business model, but I've got a better one. I've got a better one. We'll go to the honor system, right? Like, close the toll booth, let whoever's brother-in-law is sitting there, you know, go find something else to do. Uh, we're 19 cents ahead. You know, put out a gold, put out a cigar box, somebody will throw in some money just to be nice once in a while. We'll... Uh, I don't know a state that uh, doesn't uh, revile and uh, despise its Bureau of Motor Vehicles. There's a little story I can tell you about that if I get time. But in any event, the point was if you sat, I used to say people go to the Indiana BMV with a uh, box lunch and a copy of War and Peace and hope not to, <laughs> hope not to finish both before somebody noticed they were there. And, uh, but you know, but the, of course the attitude there was, so what? What are you going to do about it? And um, our folks, when some of our young uh, tigers went around with, to have a look at state government, they did some pretty creative things. One was they went through the garages and looked at cars where the, it looked to, not to have moved for a little while, put pennies on the tires, rear tires, came back in a month, and if the penny was still there, you know, it was like, give us the keys. They walked down one quarter. There were uh, six print shops, all in adjacent rooms. Each department of any size had its own. And in one room, people were working overtime. There were tax forms needed or something like that. In the next room, they were playing pinochle with nothing to do. So these are the sorts of things one encounters. The fruit hangs very, very low in government. <laughs> it's what my military friends call a target-rich environment. <laughs> now, uh, how do, if the world is not going to induce you to be accountable, well, how do you do it? And so among the things that we have tried, first of all, you have to measure people. You have to at least, uh, you know, by the way, my experience and my, my intuition, now my experience, most government employees are, are they're there for a reason, and they sincerely want to do a good job. And uh, I don't buy the caricatures, and I don't tell the jokes that uh, so many people do. But the setup uh, it won't naturally lead to it. Uh, so we began by measuring everything. You know, we, uh, on the, using the old uh, Walmart, uh, 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 slogan, if you're not keeping score, you're just practicing. And uh, it's important to decide what to measure. Now, in our case, uh, I told our appointees before any of us was sworn in, I said, look, every great enterprise I ever saw had a very clear purpose. Everybody in it knew what it was. Everybody knew what their part was or their unit's part was to producing that. Okay, here's ours. We're here to raise the disposable income of Hoosiers. Um, we're going to do everything we can to make sure that the next job is it uh, comes here, not somewhere else, that it pays on average more than the jobs of today. And then we're going to try to run the people's business such that folks keep more of those dollars for their own lives and purposes. That's it. And we're going to find whatever you're doing, wherever you are, we're going to identify what you and your colleagues can do or do better or maybe stop doing to make that result more likely. And we're going to measure that, and something good's going to happen to you if if you're doing well. And quite often what you wind up measuring is time. I said we will operate at the speed of business, not the speed of government. You know, and time is money is not a figure of speech. It's a literal axiom. And so we, for instance, we measure ex how long it takes you to get a permit or the state's permission to do this or that. How long it takes if you, if the state owes you money because you overpaid your taxes, how long till you get it back in a refund? These kind of things. In, some, in, a, in a move that I don't believe has been replicated elsewhere in public sector America, not, not that I'm aware of, we moved to performance pay the first chance we got. And people in our, and it's in the case study, but people in our uh, state government uh, for the last several years have been paid. Uh, uh, those at the, at the, uh, who have performed the very, very best have had, some of them back to back to back, the biggest raises in state history. Those at the other end whose performance was found unsatisfactory. By the way, nobody was even evaluated before we started this. Everybody just got exactly the same treatment. What could be less fair, first of all, and less conducive to a good outcome than paying the person who's working her tail off 
productively, exactly the same, treating her exactly the same as the guy sitting there reading the sports section all year long. And so uh, we, we, uh, we did that early on, and in, our last, in this last two years, we also rewrote the 70-year-old civil service laws of the state to make it much easier to uh, um, require performance and act on it if, uh, promptly if it's not there. Um, we, we back this up with other rewards and recognitions. We shower recognitions, particularly on those uh, state employees, particularly on frontline workers who find a way to do whatever they're doing better at the same cost or uh, as well at a lower cost. And I love those occasions. And honestly, the, the ones that excite me the most are not where we saved a lot of money because somebody in a supervisory position made a big move. In fact, we don't, all we give them is a pat on the back. I like the ones where some frontline worker found a way to save or maybe even a, a reasonably small amount of money. But what it tells me is that, that uh, uh, we are working at building a culture of efficiency and economy in which everyone uh, believes that it is part of their job to try to uh, serve um, our employers the people of Indiana well, and to, and to do that at the most efficient cost we can. It has to be said that government unions are a huge impediment to this. And on my first day in office, with a lot of trepidation, and I almost didn't do it, I struck down the, uh, uh, what was not statutorily uh, uh, required or permitted in Indiana, only by action of a previous governor's executive order, I, I rescinded that res executive order. Um, it really wasn't much about money, at least looking backward it wasn't, but it had profound effects. It meant that 160 pages of thou shalt nots um, were no longer uh, in, uh, in existence. And um, almost none of the changes that we made could have happened, at least not without months of negotiation and so forth. You couldn't pick up, I used to say, uh, you know, this, this bottle and move it from here to here without a long negotiation with somebody. We couldn't have combined departments, which we began doing immediately. We couldn't have broken others ap uh, uh, apart for more special uh, concentration as we did with child services and, uh, uh, and child support. Um, we certainly couldn't have outsourced or contracted for things that could have uh, that, that now are being delivered uh, at uh, higher quality and at lower costs. Uh, Robert Kennedy said, uh, uh, progress requires change, and change always has its enemies. In public sector America these days, um, there are no um, uh, stronger uh, opponents of change, almost any change, than um, our public sector unions. And uh, I'm in good company in believing we made a wrong turn. I'm in the company of George Meany, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Fiorello LaGuardia, and a lot of other people, and believing it was just a mistake to uh, import uh, the essential uh, practice of collective bargaining from the private sector into government, where it sits on both sides of the table. Um, now we, did, uh, we did look case by case, it's important to say, for opportunities to deliver a service uh, by contract um, as opposed to directly. Um, and, um, you know, in my first month or so in the job, a brilliant young guy uh, uh, who uh, came and took uh, charge and revolutionized our, our correction system in many ways called me up and said, Did you know you're paying $1.43 a meal for food? And I said, No, is that a lot? He said, Yeah, it's a lot. Where I came from, it was 95 cents and the food was better. But he said, we weren't trying to cook it ourselves in 26 or 27 separate little kitchens, buy you know, milk 10 gallons at a time here and lo you know, five loaves of bread at a time here. He said, we hired somebody who does this for a living. He says, do you care if I go check? I said, no, find out. If we don't get a better deal, we won't do it. He's back in about a month, had a bid from an international company, a nationally known company, 98 cents a meal, as I recall. We've saved over $100 million doing that. He put, and the food's better. He put nutritional requirements and things like that into the, into the bid. Those print shops I told you about, along with things like mail delivery, are now uh, handled in one place by people who are extraordinarily expert 
at doing that. Um, now, uh, 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 Dr. Widener mentioned some of this. Uh, it did have, it did have financial benefits. We um, measured in the hundreds of millions of dollars, and now on a, most of that, all of that, on a recurring basis. Um, we do have a budget surplus. We have more than two billion in reserves. We'll be giving um, each taxpayer uh, per capita a, a refund this year because they are beyond a point we've deemed uh, um, protective and safe. Um, but that's, I, I want to stress, oh, it, it, it was not primarily about dollars and cents. It was primarily about uh, delivering to the people of our state the government they deserve, and we thought the services that, that they uh, uh, had paid for. And uh, in a national survey last year, uh, people in each state were asked to rate the effectiveness or, of their state government. And 77% of the people of our state rated us uh, as effective. The median was in the high 40s. There were states in the 20s. The only state with us was Montana. And I'm not sure what they have what they have government for in Montana. I don't know <laughs> what, what they do out there. But um, and, and those agencies that I talked about are many of many of them are seen as national models. Some of them individually are the subject of case studies right now. If you go to our Bureau of Motor Vehicles today, uh, if you went there last month, your total visit time from the moment that a greeter, um, you know, Walmart style, said. Uh, uh, good afternoon, Ms. Widener. What are you here for? Uh, commercial driver's license. You want to talk to Rick on line three. From the moment that you did that until the moment your transaction cleared the uh, register was uh, nine minutes and 48 seconds and on average. And it was on the receipt, so you'd know, along with whatever that transaction cost you. Our Department of Natural Resources is operating at the highest bookings it's ever had. Its revenues are the highest they ever are. This is important because all those dollars go right back into making our parks better and to acquiring a new land for conservation purposes, which we've done at record rates. And so, um, to me, this, this is the reason that it is so important that the people of goodwill, regardless of their differences on what it is government should do and how much of that government should do, uh, ought to be more attentive than they are to the way in which it's done and more insistent than they are about how that could occur. And I've been, now I'm, in, I'm at the point in this uh, tenure in which media and others are starting to ask you know, these sort of reflective look back questions. And, and uh, when they get to you know, what, what do you want people to remember, uh, there are things we have done in terms of, of policy reforms that I'm happy about. Uh, the radical reforms of property taxation and education and, and health insurance for the uninsured and, and our ethics rules of the state. And there are things that I, I hope will have a long time impact. But what I really hope uh, will occur is that my fellow citizens will be a little less cynical by virtue of, of our having come and gone. We tried to conduct ourselves uh, both in campaigning for office, no negative ads, none of that, and in the conduct of office in a way that was affirmative and positive. Um, we insisted, we had a zero tolerance attitude and a scandal free uh, toward ethical uh, uh, violations and a, and a scandal free eight years. I learned to be, I wasn't at first, but I learned to be very careful about divisive language. I've never, I don't use the L and C words. I don't, you know, talk about left and right. I, uh, uh, we just try to talk about those things that might, people might agree on, or at least might, uh, uh, to some extent, unite on. Um, and I'm hoping that uh, people will notice that we weren't on the make for anything else, weren't running for some other office while we were holding this one. Just, uh, along with our whole administration, just had no other agenda but the improvement of our state. But most of all, I hope people will reflect back and, uh, and, and with a little greater sense of confidence that government actually can deliver. I think this is awfully important. Obviously, I come from the side of the tracks that uh, believes that 
Um, both liberty and economic opportunity are enhanced when government is careful but not to do too much. Um, uh, we believe in, uh, in our administration in limited but active government. So we might believe that the sphere of activity should be smaller than other might, others might, but as I hope I've just illustrated, we believe that inside that sphere, government has an equally solemn duty. If it has a solemn duty not to do things it shouldn't, it has an equally solemn duty to do those things it should proficiently and faithfully and efficiently. And I hope that we've advanced the ball just a little bit there because as I tell people on my side of the tracks all the time, skepticism about big government is very healthy and very American. But we should never let it be transmuted into contempt for all government, which is corrosive of the public confidence that we all have to have. We are all in this together in this country. And uh, this, this topic that I've just tried to brush over so very, very uh, quickly seems to me ought to be one of those things we might all agree to agree on. So I thank you very much for this opportunity to be here and for the questions that will follow. I'm very excited about the Wilson School's um, venture and activities into uh, innovations for successful governance. Thank you. Thank you. So it is a Princeton rule that students get to ask the first question, so I'm going to ask students to come down to the microphones if they have questions. But while we wait for people to uh, come to the mic, I wonder if I could ask you a question, because you deployed a wide range of reforms in your terms in office, but to do that, you actually had to change the governor's office as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things we talk about a bit in the case, but I, I hope you might elaborate on, are the changes you had to make. When you first came into office, you had lots and lots of department heads and others reporting to you, so there was a real span of control problem. You had, to, you had lots of uh, fragmentation in the upper reaches of the uh -huh. state government. What did you do? Uh, well, let me first say that uh, this is in, in really an excellent report, which I just saw this morning when I uh, turned on the uh, iPad. Uh, one of the things I think it doesn't square exactly uh, is the, with, with uh, the way I look at it is this particular area. Uh, the, the, to the extent I could characterize the government as we got there, nobody was reporting to the governor. They were All the agencies were running on their own and doing what they pleased. Uh, with little or no oversight, and, and they didn't mind telling people this. And I heard, an I knew anecdotes, and people finally, you know, in frustration with a, with a given agency, came to the governor's office, got what they thought was a favorable reaction, went back to the agency, the agency said, doesn't make any difference, you know, we won't hear from them. Um, so the first thing we did, made it plain to everybody, is I, that we're going to have some purpose around here. In fact, it's going to be a very clear, simple one. I defined it for you. And everybody, is accountable for that, and we're going to be there to measure. Now, um, we did establish on a, right out of the box uh, an, an office uh, uh, of management and budget to follow up and to, with a roving portfolio, to find ways to improve, and that we talked about. Uh, ultimately, we did uh, have, and this was not a, this is I think typical, not novel. Uh, people in our office who each were, were, was responsible for a g given number of agencies. But honestly, I, I made a point of staying in personal contact with at least the top uh, cabinet and agency heads. Um, uh, I wanted them to know that I was watching personally. I had a little, had a little thing on my computer where I can call up everybody's metrics, you know, green, yellow, red, all that. Uh, and, and I was interested in what they were doing and attentive to what they were doing. And um, so um, uh, I, I, was, I, I don't agree that I ever allowed a layer uh, to uh, you know, insulate me from any of the, at least the frontline activity. Thank you. So I think we have uh, two people with questions at the mics. Um, let's start. Hi. Um, thank you, Devon. Um, thank you very much for coming today and listening to the huh? Um, and the, it was overturned, and that was upheld just recently by the 
Right. Um, and given that uh, Kumacher's study has shown that uh, for every dollar that you spend helping women uh, avoid unintended pregnancies, and we'll say $3.70 in future costs, and that in New England Journal of Medicine study has just shown that um, offering contraception free of charge will also reduce unintended pregnancies. I was wondering why we thought it, why is it a good public policy to eliminate funding for such an organization that so Yeah. Funding. Okay, well it wasn't my initiative. It came to me for signature as one part of a very large bill. Uh, it also bears noting, uh, uh, I'm, I'm not using this, I'm not saying this was the, a reason, but uh, uh, in a, I think a flaw in Indiana constitutional law, governor's vetoes are overridden just by simple majority, doesn't, even, doesn't take a super majority. So I'm very sparing with vetoes because, um, you know, there will be other fights to fight. But, uh, you know, I thought hard about it. And the first thing I did was make sure that, uh, not a single woman in a single community in our state would have lacked for reproductive care. I, had, I ordered an inventory. I wanted to make sure there were at least, there were at least, as it turned out, five providers even in the tiniest county. The next thing I did was I ordered uh, our Department of Health to contact every Medicaid recipient. They wrote them all and emailed those they had emails for and told them exactly where the, the care was available. So having satisfied myself, nobody would be out a single appointment or a single opportunity for whatever care they were seeking, I let the thing become law. So, but it's fine, you know, if the, if the court has said this is not, doesn't square with uh, federal statute, that's, I accept that. So I'm not quarreling with any of the data, you know, I'm just saying it wouldn't have made any difference. If those benefits are there, they would have been there if the law had been upheld. Talking about foreign assistance, aid? In foreign aid. Yeah. Uh, in my experience, measurement and efficiency are never innocuous terms. And whenever you try to implement these types of reforms, there are always winners and losers, whether it's clinical players who are losing their leisure or the other guys who are losing their overtime. So I'm curious, you spoke a little bit about this. I would like to hear more how you manage the politics of this type of reform, um, how you deal with winners or losers, perceptions in the, in the public of of the effectiveness and how you get agencies on board with making these Yeah. Well, it's, uh, you know, just to give you a couple of quick uh, uh, glimpses. Um, when we, when we um, ended the collective bargaining, I, I say in my book and other places, I pulled the covers up and feared the worst. You know, I, I hadn't seen the Wisconsin scene of this year, but I imagined something like that. And I was very reluctant to risk, we had this huge agenda of other things we had, we had run on very explicitly. We told people, if you don't want change, don't vote for us. If you vote for us, here are a whole long list of things we're going to try to do to get this sleepy, stagnant state in motion. And um, I was really worried about all of that being jeopardized if uh, there was some kind of a you know, riot over this. Well, there wasn't. The only thing that changed was the 160 pages went away. And in, within a few months, 90 plus percent of the workers quit paying the dues, the mandatory dues. It's still, you know, we didn't tell them they, we didn't say anything. We still collect them at the paycheck. So that turned out to be much easier than I ever imagined. There was a little referendum and employees voted to, um, with their paycheck, so to speak. Um, with regard to, uh, there are a couple things that I didn't take time with, but for instance, when we have contracted for services, it's always been a part of the bid that the incumbent employees get the jobs, or at least first shot at the jobs. So employee protection was always paramount. And I think this went a long way toward reassuring people. By the way, we had the experience over and over where employees would go to a meeting, they'd, they'd, they'd see their options, you stay where you are, meaning we'll find you another job in state government, same pay, et cetera, or you can go to this uh, private firm. And we had uh, instances where essentially almost 100% chose the private firm. Usually sometimes benefits were better, there was upward mobility, I don't, you know, different reasons. But we, I, uh, I think by stressing that this was about serving the public and that uh, we were, 
we would look after the interest of those who had been doing it in the old way. But you know, the, the folks playing pinochle, I, we don't mean them, didn't mean them any ill, but they had no right. There's no right to a job at the public expense. And they had no right to you know, uh, work half a day and for a full day's pay. Really? <laughs> you don't have to out him completely, but what's he teach? Um, I was wondering how you're planning on implementing like, your philosophy towards yeah. government um, into the next seven Oh, gee, I haven't got a clue. You know, the, uh, uh, obviously, uh, uh, obviously, a higher education is, uh, is an utterly different place. And governance is different. You know, this isn't something I was oblivious to before. I've studied a lot since. By the way, I'm among the people I had the, one of the most useful conversations with, read his book, was former President Bowen here. Very, very helpful to me. But um, no, it's different. And yet I think uh, the world of higher ed screams for, uh, and its customers increasingly do, for more attention to this, if, there, you know, if government is insulated, think how it's been in higher ed. And uh, now at a time when student debt exceeds credit card debt, and when it is uh, not clear at all that um, the, 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 the true value, any learning value is occurring in many of our schools, um, there's a huge opportunity, I believe, uh, for, uh, for schools to separate themselves, and people need, we need to do it. I mean, higher ed has been such an ace in the hole for this country, and it's still, the, with its flaws, the finest system in the world. But it, its critics have, have a lot of points. I have to say something uh, I'm, I'm proud to say. Uh, one of the charges about higher ed is that the, the rigor's gone. Great inflation and so forth. Very interesting to study the data on this. Princeton is an outlier. Congratulations. Uh, Purdue is a huge outlier. The average grade at Purdue University has barely budged in 35 years. It's down there on the x-axis and everybody else is in this cloud that kind of goes like this. And um, so I, I absolutely, people say, you know, what do you had hoped to do there? I said, I'll be a while, give me a little while longer, but I'll tell you one thing. I think um, uh, we're gonna work hard to try to stretch the value equation at both ends to make sure that the quality of the learning uh, is as high as it can be, and that means investing more. We're, we're just about to add 100 engineering faculty. And uh, I, I hope we, uh, maybe we can steal some from Princeton, I don't know. <laughs> I hope they're as good as the, as the faculty here. And at the other end, you know, we're a land-grant school and a state school without a gigantic endowment. And uh, so I feel a very strong responsibility to make sure that just as we didn't waste tax dollars, that we don't waste uh, uh, students dollars. I've already said, I, I've done six open forums of 75 minutes each with you know, college by college and so forth. And I've said to my colleagues to be that we're, we gotta remember that essentially every dollar that we spend around here, whatever it's for, came from a family or a taxpayer. And so we have a, we have a little bit of a duty to be careful with it. But I'm real excited about it. Uh, uh, what's your dad teach? Fantastic. Well, you know, last, last word on this, I didn't mean to go off, but uh, uh, there was recent, a recent uh, analysis that I really loved. It's not the first time this has been seen, but they looked at the uh, success of graduates of all the schools, five and 15 years out, measured in earnings, compared it to the tuition. And uh, the school where I'll be was uh, top 10. And uh, that's where, you know, I, I, I think every school in higher ed ought to want to be. Thanks. Thanks for uh, being with us today. Sure. Um, I read an interview of yours a few years ago, which you listed um, your at least five favorite books or books that you think you should most. Um, I guess they included Hayek's sort of the Serpentum um, and um, Charles Murray's uh, What It Means to Be a Libertarian. So mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I've, uh, 
I'm within 80 days of uh, the end of my only elected office, and I've gotten away without any labels, and so I don't want to embrace one now. But yeah, that would, that would be as close. It's a fair question. That would be as close, I think. Uh, certainly as defined by Charles Murray, um, that would be as close as any I can think of. And, uh, you know, it's, at its wellspring, it's, it's about the, the uh, equal dignity of every individual and the um, um, uh, importance of allowing a maximum zone of, of freedom and with it the concomitant responsibility, you know, um, that, that, uh, to, to make wise or unwise choices that I think is essential to a long-running democracy. So um, I don't, I've never proclaimed myself, and I'm not doing it now, but in response to a fair question, I'd, it's pretty close. He has an excellent question. I've had it before. And I, I, you know, born optimist that I am, or bred optimist that I am, I'd have to say it not, I, let me put it this way. Um, it, it sometimes is, sometimes people say, I wish the next president would do that kind of thing. Well, look, um, being certainly at the level of, um, of policy, yeah, sure. I mean, we could and I hope will decide. We simply have to prioritize and square ends with means, or you, you know, you're getting the shaft, and everybody your age is and, and older. Um, now, when it means the sort of things I concentrated on here, operational reforms and improvements, an honest answer is, I don't think the next president should spend a lot of his time or energy. You couldn't work harder at this than we did the first two and a half years of the last administration. I think some progress was made, but. If you know, it's, you only have in a in a in a four-year term, you know, fourteen hundred and twenty-eight days, whatever it is, and um, and I don't think, it's especially given the immensity of the dangers facing the the country and its future right now, I wouldn't spend a lot of time and effort on it. Maybe selectively pick a couple of agencies. Uh, uh, it really ought to work a lot better than they can and would make some real difference if they did. Thank you, Governor Daniel. I'm a Wilson School student mm -hmm. and also a senior leader alum. Oh. So mm -hmm. I have a question. I'm, I'm growing increasingly concerned about how bipartisanship has become a dirty word in the Republican Party. And I'm wondering how you think that public discourse will be shifted so that it's no longer viewed as a negative quality. Right. Well, I, I, both sides, I, I can't, I can't uh, say that either side um, uh, is any better than, than the other on this score. I mean, so let's be even-handed to start with. I mean, uh, I won't go further on that. But um, the, the one way I know, this is a, uh, the book I wrote, um, it talks about this, if it talks about anything, is that uh, it, it would seem to me that a start back would be to identify uh, those problems, and there's one uh, transcendent one, the debt we've piled up, the debt we've scheduled for ourselves, the complete unworkability of this, either fiscally or economically, and certainly not in terms of social justice, of spending money on oneself that it's not your money, it's your money and people younger than you. Um, that, that we ought to make common, maybe we could make common purpose out of that. I suggested in that book uh, a uh, truce on so-called social issues you know, about which people are very sincerely uh, divided, you know. I, I credit the sincerity of everybody on every side of these questions. Um, and, uh, you know, that we might, facing a threat as large as we are, as like, uh, I believe we are, um, just sort of set those aside for a while and try to make common, pur common cause and common purpose. You know, it strikes me as a, such an irony. It, those who, unlike me, believe sincerely in a very large, very expansive and involved federal government have the greatest interest of all in a pro-growth economic policy that generates the revenues to pay for all that have the greatest interest of all in not allowing us to go over a Niagara of debt which will, which will wreck all those things that they hold dear. 
when the you know, Chinese quit lending his money to do it. And so that would be my answer. How about at least till the danger is dealt with honestly, as people in both parties want to do, just not everybody in both parties and not the leadership of the party in power right now. Um, and then, you know, if we get past that, then we can go back to squabbling about some of these things that, however important, I don't think are nation-threatening in the way that, that this issue is. Best I can do for you. Yeah? Hi. Um, my question is also about Purdue because my parents are also professors there. Really? I, you guys, if you've got a minute, hang around after. I really want to meet you both. But. Um, and they're actually both professors in liberal arts. Yeah. Yeah, it's a very tough question. You know, Purdue didn't even have a liberal arts school until midway through the last century. It was a land-grant school, and it, and it made a big uh, emphasis out of engineering beyond most land-grant schools. Indiana has another research, actually we have two. I had dinner last night with President Notre Dame, rising as a research institution, but Indiana University, for a state of six and a half million, you really shouldn't probably have two Big Ten research universities. We do. And there, so there's, there is a complementarity there. And some of the finest liberal arts schools in the country are at Bloomington, at IU. You know, best music school on the planet. Best foreign languages schools on the planet. Great medical school and so forth. So um, it is tough. Um, but I have to say that Purdue's highest value right now in a nation so desperately in need of great scientists and engineers and people like that is to Try to excel at that. Now, you can't be, I believe, a great engineer these days without a, without a balancing grounding in the liberal arts. I'm a product of the liberal arts myself. And this is the first thing I, I've said as I met with, with your um, with mother or father, whoever, and, um, and their colleagues. And uh, we're going to want to make certain that those things are, are well taught at Purdue. But yeah, you know, but by the way, some of them are, have attracted very few students. And at some point, you have to say, you know, we can't be great at everything. We want to, if we want to be really great at the things that we can be and that are our, perhaps our highest uh, value add, um, then let's, let's do that. And the, and, the, and the student who wants to attend the very finest, uh, you know, wants to study Urdu, doesn't want to come to Purdue when 100 miles away, there's the best place you can get that. So we'll try to keep it in balance. I'm very sensitive to this, and I do understand. Uh, thanks for coming, Governor Daniels. I'm also a former Hoosier. Yeah. And um, so I was hoping to, to hear your thoughts on why we don't need unions in the public sector and what some of the trade offs are to, yeah. in your view, of getting rid of them. Well, once again, uh, you know, the, the, first of all, the abuses should be obvious by now. You've seen the incredible um, uh, abuses of, of, that have come from unimpeded power of, of this in other places, people with two and three with enormous uh, uh, pensions and all the rest. You know, the civil service reform and then eventually, um, as recently as the 60s, you know, we had no unions in government, and the argument was, that's the public interest there. You, can't, you don't want the same people sitting on both sides of the table, and that's basically what you have. And uh, you know, who represents the citizen? Who represents the taxpayer? But um, uh, you know, in our state and, and across America, there's been a great inversion, I have sometimes called it. Once upon a time, you really did have to worry about public employees either being the victims of a patronage system, which we got rid of, thank goodness, uh, or uh, just being, uh, having their, uh, being underpaid and exploited or something. Well, the average public employee in this country now makes a lot more than the person who's, than the private sector employee who's paying for his or her salary and benefits. A lot more. And so maybe, you know, if there was a problem, we have fixed it in spades. And um, as I said, my principal concern, from an Indiana standpoint, certainly our principal concern was less the extra 
dollars, which was a real issue, but the, uh, the insuperable impediments to change and reform that this, springs, that this brings up. This is the most powerful special interest in America today. And you can say, well, I like it. You know, that's my special interest. I like them. Well, okay, but fine. I'm just saying. You look at who gives the most political contributions. Stack them up. You know, who, who is the most active in, in the political process? And that's a, bit, that's a long way from the way the founders drew it up, or even as it operated not that long ago. Well, that, are, are, we to, are we classmates? Yes, we are. And you were, you are? Debbie. Yes, you are, Debbie. How nice to see you. <laughs> Yeah. And look, I was under print shops. Okay. Right. You know, one of the crown jewels at Purdue is Purdue University Press. And you know, at Virginia, at the Missouri, they're putting some uh -huh. considerable heat about university priorities, budgeting, and the independence and the value of the university press. I just want to recommend to you yeah. Charles Watkinson, who is the head of Thank the press. Okay. And comes to us from Charleston Street here. And Thank you. He is a rising star. Well, I, good. You know, I, I, it's one of those things. I, I just met some folks from there at um, it was some sort of a fair. I was walking through it at the campus, and it was my first exposure. I took their little their latest catalog and all, but it's something I've got to learn a lot, learn a lot more about. Thank you. Thank you for the tip. Thank you. And I understand that that has to be the last question. Can we squeeze her in? She's been waiting enough. I'm quick. Waiting, I'll be we'll real quick. Her in. Yeah. Oh. Well, let me tell you. I keep a, uh, uh, a list in my left-hand drawer because you know a lot happens and you might forget. I list the things that we either didn't disappointments, mistakes, large and small. Um, there must have been a better. We tried hard and we got a certain distance trying to reform local government in our state. And I went at it the best way I could think to. We, we, I got my predecessor from the other party and the Chief Justice of our Supreme Court, a Princeton alum, class of 69, two highly respected folks and a commission, and they did up a report. But we, only, and we worked as hard as we could, and it was as bipartisan as, we could, as it could be, and we just couldn't get there. And we've still got, we will leave, uh, I regret to say, with a uh, still, uh, well, we cleaned up some of the clutter. The, uh, still, a whole lot of this, basically, Northwest Ordinance, Pioneer Days, townships, multiple local offices, stuff that. <laughs> well, you know, uh, we're hardly alone. I, I, I know there have been, uh, this is a concern in many, many other states too, but yeah, I'm going to regret that uh, somehow we weren't more persuasive, better organized, um, more successful in. Uh, in, in doing that. Our state sooner or later will need to do this. And uh, we got, at best, a third of the way there. Yeah. So thank you very much. And on behalf of the Woodrow Wilson School. Oh, loot. Maybe, yeah, loot. <laughs> thank you. Oh, thank you. I won't hold you accountable. Thank you.